So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you to dissection of an amphibian. And this is lesson one. And uh, we know that amphibians can be toads, frogs, salamanders, and newts. And for the purposes of this lesson, we shall major look at the toads and the frogs. So you're welcome to lesson one. Uh, wherever you are, I want to request you to subscribe to this page and uh, follow all our lessons live so that you can be able to learn more about different topics in biology and other subjects as well. So, dear students, I want to welcome you once again to the dissection of an amphibian. And I want you to watch this video so that we start from there. And the scales to protect them. Most have four legs. Hello, everybody. Just look at a truly amazing group of vertebrates. When they're born, they usually live in water, but when they grow up and become adults, they spend most of their time on land. We present the amphibians. some common characteristics that you should know about, so you can recognize and differentiate them. Amphibians have thin, bare skin with no hairs and scales to protect them. Most have four legs and a membrane between their toes that allows them to move much better in the water. are viparous, but they don't incubate their eggs after laying them. They abandon them and don't care for their young. Not very good parents, huh? When they hatch, they small larvae and live in water. Very slowly, their bodies go through a process called During this process, the body of the amphibian changes. The front and rear legs, their limbs grow, and their heads and their bodies develop, so they finally look like their parents. In the early stages of their lives, amphibians breathe through gills. But when they grow up and become adults, they breathe with their lungs. But the problem is, their lungs are very small and cannot get all the oxygen they need. Nature is very clever and has solved this problem by allowing them to breathe and get the oxygen they need through their skin. That's why they need to be near water to keep their skin wet. In the early stages of their life, some amphibians are herbivores, but when they grow up, most become carnivores. So they need to hunt. Some have a long, sticky tongue they shoot out to capture prey. Aren't amphibians fascinating and also a bit strange? So let's remember the most important characteristics. Amphibians are vertebrates. They're oviparous. In the early stages of their life, they live in water as larvae. But slowly they change until they look like their parents. This process of change is called metamorphosis. Amphibians are carnivores, so they have to hunt to eat. They have thin, smooth skin and breathe through their skin. Thank you so much. 
yeah at least we have seen some of the facts about uh, the amphibian so we can proceed uh, with our lesson thanks to youtube so, so uh, organisms that live both in water and on land so what is called an amphibian is an organism that lives both in water and sometimes on land and there are quite a number of them we have frogs toads we have salamanders and newts but uh, for the purposes of this lesson and for the purposes of our curriculum we are looking at the amphibians that are very easy to find especially in our country and those ones are majorly the dogs and the toads these amphibians have quite similar structures both externally and internally so whichever one you find it will give us what we want for the purposes of this lesson um, let's look at the classification of the amphibians well, the green one is the frog and uh, the red the red one is the toad so we have the frog and then the toad so we are trying to classify them uh, they all belong to kingdom animalia they both belong to phylum codata they both belong to class amphibia they both belong to order anura the diversion starts from the family where the frog belongs to buffonide family buffonide and then the toad belongs to family ranide and then the genus for the frog is buffo and the genus for the toad is rana the species for the frog is regularis and then the species for the toad is so that is the classification of the frog and the toad you can be asked to classify um, an amphibian or giving the kingdom phylum class or the family genus or its species you should be able to now classify them very well yeah so thank you for that we proceed to the comparing the two the frog and the toad are quite similar and even in the local languages we do not have a difference between a frog and a toad they usually have the same language the same the two for example in, in luganda they say a chikere over a wikere that means the frog or the toad but uh, as biology students you should be able to differentiate between the two and when you look at them there are quite some differences that can show you what a frog is and what a toad is some of the quick facts include the following when you look at the frog you realize that it has a slim body its body is slim and then for the toad the body is stout yeah that's the body type and then when you look at the frogs the skin is thin wet smooth and usually having some drifting colors either greenish or yellowish and then for the toad the skin is thick dry and usually brownish or dull colored and then for the case of the frogs they lay their eggs in clusters meaning eggs are laid in bunches and then for the case of the toad their eggs are laid in chains that's interesting right and then for the frogs they have very long legs and that of course defines the reason why they jump a very long distance they almost fly and then for the toads they have short legs and for them they jump distances and most cases yeah toads majorly live on land and frogs are easily found so those are some of the differences between the frog and the toad so let's look at uh, a much more summarized version here of the differences between the frog and the toad uh, the skin of the frog is smooth shiny and moist whereas the one for the toad the skin is rough 
water and less moist yes water means it has patches because of the glands it has around the skin and then the frog has very long slender flexible hind limbs that are highly folded into the body so when you look at the legs of the frog they you realize they are very long they are longer they are more flexible and more folded and then for the ones for the toad uh, the hind limbs are averagely long they are not so long compared to the ones for the frog they are also muscular and equally folded but the ones for the frog are more folded into the body the frog the color of the body is greenish uh, with some black or dark brown or yellowish spots so the frog usually is colored it has some interesting colors either greenish or yellowish or brownish uh, whereas for the toad the color is majorly dark brown uh, or sometimes grayish so and dull not shiny so the, the toad is more dull colored compared to the frog the eyes of the frog usually bulge out further so when you look at the eyes of the frog you realize they are bigger compared to the average body size their eyes are relatively bigger compared to the head size i mean uh, uh, relative to the, to the size of the head and then for the toad the eyes are less bulging they are not as bulging as the ones for the frog and then uh, the the glands there's, there's what we call parotid glands or poison glands usually back or towards the head region of these organisms you realize that the, the frog most cases does not have the parotid glands so its skin is just smooth throughout the head region whereas for the toad they have very much prominent uh, parotid glands these glands are sometimes called poison glands and they are used to secrete uh, milky substance that is used to to scare away the predators so those are some of the differences between the frog and the toad so let's continue and watch this other video for more details about the differences between the frog and the toad uh, so that we can be able to appreciate much more and meanwhile you can also look for the frogs around your uh, places of where you stay you can look for frogs and toads and compare them so that we are at par so let's Hello, look at this video here today and toads. So please enjoy the video. First, the toads have dry, bumpy skin and only spread about 3% of their life in the water when they're larva stage and when they're mating. And frogs spend about 95% of their life in the water. Uh, so that's opposite. And they're wet and slimy. So that part is pretty much the complete opposite. When toads are stalking their prey, they'll usually climb up to it very slowly and use camouflage because they have short, short tongues. Frogs, on the other hand, just look at their prey, dive at it with their long tongues, and just hope they catch it. Uh, here's the underbelly of the frog. The frog's underbelly is very white because they don't need any camouflage for that part. On the other hand, toads need the camouflage there. And toads also like to play dead, so do frogs sometimes as their last defense mechanism, so there they are both playing dead. Uh, and as for habitat, as I said, dry and wet. Uh, later on in the channel, I'll make a video of how to make a frog habitat and a toad habitat. And that's pretty much it. Thanks for watching YouTube. Like, subscribe, and comment for more videos. Uh, thank you so much for watching that video. And I know you have appreciated further the difference between the frog and the toad. Well, let's, so let's move on to some of the facts about these organisms. Let's look at the reasons why they are classified into phylum, codata, class amphibia, and order anura. 
So there are distinguishing characteristics that put these organisms in those different taxa. So let's start with uh, phylum Codata. Why do we classify amphibians or toads and frogs into phylum Codata? So to begin with, they possess a vertebral column that usually you can feel from the back of the animal. So when you look at the back of the animal, you should be able to see a line that is made up of bones that runs from the head towards the caudal area. And that is the vertebral column. It is characteristic of all members of phylum Codata. The second one, I mean, uh, we can still look at uh, the actual location of the vertebral column there. Uh, you can see the vertebral bones uh, very much clear in the skeleton there. Okay. The other uh, distinguishing characteristics for codets is that they possess the pentadactyl limb plan. So what is the pentadactyl limb plan? So you realize that uh, the pentadactyl limb plan is the, 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 the condition of one limb terminating into five digits. So when you look at the digits or the fingers or the toes of these organisms, you realize that there is a pentadactyl plan. There are five, there are supposed to be five digits on the hind limb and five on the fore limb. However, on the fore limb, as a result of modifications or evolution, one of the digits was either lost or modified. But the limb plan is supposed to be five. So when you count them, there are five. And this is the characteristic of all the codets. Well, well, then the other one is they have bilateral body symmetry externally. So when you look at them externally, you can easily see that the body can be divided into two equal or two mirror-like images. So as you can see this one here, you can see that the body is easily divided or can easily be divided into two equal parts along one plane. So that's another characteristic of members of phylum or data. So let's go to characteristics of amphibians. So these are characteristics that are shared by most and if not all the amphibians. The first one is they have a thin moist glandular skin or water skin. So when you look at the skins of the amphibians, you realize that it's moist. This of course supports what we call cutaneous gaseous exchange uh, or movement of gases in and out of the body through the skin. Uh, it is favored by the moist uh, skin there, you can see. Amphibians also have a wide gap. So when you look at their, their gap, their mouth is extended almost from ear to ear. So it's uh, extremely wide relative to the body size. And that is common to most of the amphibians, as you can see there. The other one is possession of webs between the digits of the hind limb. So as you can see, the amphibians have webbed feet, as you can see. The hind limbs are usually webbed, and this, of course, is an adaptation for a swimming in water. Enables them to swim in water or to push the waves of water in order to move. Interesting. And then, uh, what are the characteristics of Anura or order Anura, where the toad and the frog belong to? The first one is possession of external eardrum sometimes called the tympanic membrane. So these members of order Anura actually possess external eardrum. Did you know that? Yes. So you can see from there, uh, that round drum-like structure there is the external eardrum. It's used majorly, of course, for collection of sound. So it is external. Most of the animals, especially mammals, have internal eardrum. They have the outside one is the pinna, which the amphibians don't have. For the amphibians, their hearing system starts from the eardrum, which in this case 
is external. The other one is they have long hind limbs and those hind limbs or legs are used for leaping or hopping or in simple terms you can say for jumping. So those hind limbs are longer so as to generate a, a propulsion force so they could jump long distances. And then the head and the trunk are fused. So when you look at this organism you realize that the head and the trunk are joined together. They do not have a significantly notified or easily notified neck. So you can easily say that they don't have the neck. So the head and the trunk are just joined together and there is no no neck for these organisms. Yes, so let's proceed and look at the habitat for the amphibians. Habitat means where do they stay? So when you look at the frogs, you realize that uh, they are usually found in a damp environments or in a moist, much more moist environments or wet environments. For example, the grass near waters, the swamps, the ponds, the slow flowing streams. Uh, that's where you can find the, the frogs easily. And then for the case of the toads, you realize that they are also found in the damp areas, but not so much like the frogs. And then uh, you can easily find them even in more terrestrial habitats, like behind buildings, gardens, abandoned, abandoned storage tanks, under the stones, and so on. So they are easily found uh, uh, off the water compared to the frogs. But all of them, at least, are demand to stay in a moist place. But frogs stay in a much more wet environment than the toads. So I want us to look at uh, how you could attract the toads uh, to stay in your compound. How can you attract them to come into your gardens? Of course, they are advantageous because they feed especially on the insect pests like grass hoppers and so so if you, in case you want to attract them to live near you uh, you can watch this video and then you can see how we can well, good life do that. Presents how to attract frogs and toads to your garden attracting and keeping frogs and toads in your garden will help reduce pest populations naturally without the need for pesticides they feed on many pests such as bugs, beetles, caterpillars, cutworms, grasshoppers, grubs, slugs, and a variety of other pests. A single frog can eat over 100 insects in one night. Here are some of the ways to attract frogs and toads to your garden. Eliminate chemicals. Pesticides synthetic fertilizers and herbicides to poison frogs and toads. Frogs and toads breathe and drain through their skin. Offer shelter. Most toads and frogs are nocturnal and avoid sun to prevent dehydration. Create a shelter by arranging stones into a small cave. You can also use a clay or ceramic flower pot as housing. Turn the pot upside down and prop it with rocks leaving enough room for the frog or toad to slip inside. Provide water. Toads and frogs don't drink through the mouth. Instead, they absorb moisture into their bodies by sitting in water. Place several shallow containers of water in the shade near the shelter. Just one frog or toad can eat up to 10,000 pests during the garden season. Toads and frogs will often return to the year to year as long as the environment is pleasant and there is plenty to eat. Visit growagoodlife.com for more information. Yeah, thank you so much. I hope uh, to attract the frogs and the toads into your uh, gardens or compounds. After all, you can eat to up to 10,000 pests every season or every year. Frog can eat to up to 10,000 pests. So why wouldn't you use them as biological pest control methods well you can try that out uh, and that's of course one of the reasons why we are studying this topic so we want to look at why do amphibians live near water of course we already said the habitat for these members is water moist damp areas 
there must be reasons why they prefer to live in such habitats. The first one is to keep the skin moist for cutaneous respiration. Like we said before, these organisms use their skin for gaseous exchange and therefore the skin must be moist as a characteristic for any gaseous exchange surface. It should be moist for dissolution of gases. The other one is uh, so as to easily escape from predators or enemies. I know you must have heard frogs crying somewhere or making noise at night. When you move closer, they keep quiet and they disappear. You don't see them. They simply submerge themselves into water so that you cannot easily identify where they are. So water is a good uh, medium for escape from predators. And then the other one is, and the most important, is that they lay their eggs in water. If there is no water, then we don't expect a new generation of amphibians to emerge. So they must be near water so that they return to reproduce. After all, the larval stage of the amphibians, the tadpoles, are 100% aquatic. So they live entirely in water. So then you cannot... Uh, so, thank you so much. I would like to wish to meet you in lesson two. If you enjoyed the lesson, please subscribe to this YouTube channel and learn more about biology and other subjects. Thank you.